Okay. Um, I do hear some feedback. So for those of you, um, um, if you haven't muted, go ahead and mute. And then obviously if you guys have a question, unmute and ask away. All right, so what we're doing today is we are covering um, the highlights from the last few releases. So what I did is I took um, the release information from 715, 716, and 717, and I looked for major things because, you know, there's a lot of information on each of those releases. So what I looked for were improvements, visual improvements, that um, you can see and your users can see that you can pass on to them. So what I kind of did is kind of divide this up into improvements, some bug fix bug fixes that I wanted to make note of. And, you know, there were several more, but um, I'm not going to go through all of those. And then enhancements um, over those three versions. Now we are going to have version 718 coming out here soon. Um, and so I will give you guys a little sneak peek as to what's going on with 718 because there are a couple things in there that I'm pretty excited about. Okay. So um, first thing we're going to do is talk about improvements. So um, just some of the major ones, um, or, you know, slightly uh, minor ones, too. Um, <clears throat> oh, hold on here. Oh, okay. So um, we did add a tooltip to the requisition prefixing. So if I went down to um, system and then users, I know some people had questions about um, that options in there and actually what does it mean. So I'm just going to pick on somebody here. And I'm going to edit this. And there's a requisition prefix option here. And basically this is allowing you to go in and enter any requisition prefix, prefixes here and allows the user to see any requisitions with that specified prefix. So you can put more than one in can put one in comma and then the next prefix, and those are the only requisitions that they're going to see. Now, this box will not do any good unless you check the restrict requisitions. So it even says that if this box is checked, the user will only be allowed to see requisitions with the prefixes listed above. So you going in and entering something in this top box, but not check marking this will not do any good. So you do have to, these work together. So you do have to check this as well. <clears throat> so that's been out there for a little while, but we've updated the tool tip um, to make more sense to you. Um, that was in 7.15. 7.16, we did remove some of the legacy <clears throat> um, options off of the menu. Um, one hey, of them was in trans Yes. Sorry, I have a question about the prefix. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that was there. If they add, if they create new requisitions and let it, you know, automatically number, does it number with the prefix or not? I don't think the automatic numbering is um, working yet. We don't have that as a feature yet. So they still have to keep track of their numbering. Okay. No okay, thanks. Um, so uh, the next one, any other questions about that before I move on? And going through all of this today, too, it may take a little longer than an hour, especially that I got started a little late. So we may not wrap up until after 10 sometimes. So I'm just giving you guys a heads up. Um, the next thing, like I said, 716, we did remove some of the legacy options. You won't see refunds legacy anymore. That was taken care of. Um, also, add deducts. We got rid of that in core. And um, the show sessions option, um, was also removed. So if you know, you're looking for those things, they have been removed. Um, in 717, with purchase orders, I'm going to go down to POs here. And I'm just going to pull a purchase order up. One thing that we removed from this amounts area here 
we removed the remaining invoiceable. It was over here, and we just believe that that got really confusing with users because you had the remaining invoiceable and the total remaining encumbrance. Um, so um, we did go ahead. We had some questions about it and uh, thought that we should just remove that altogether. So that field is no longer appearing in here. So we just removed that on the last release. Another improvement that uh, we did is we were having um, questions about the tax ID and the tax type um, and it being restricted. Um, what was happening is, um, well, we made a change here that standard users and obviously group manager users could see the tax ID. So let me go into vendors to show you those two fields. So this field, tax ID type and ID number. So um, we had to change um, uh, permission, the USAS underscore privacy underscore tax ID to prevent those without this permission from seeing those two fields. So like I said, standard users can see those, but um, read only and rec only users do not see those fields. So those aren't there for them. So we did make that update. Also talking about um, the roles, um, one other update we made in 717 is with standard and manager roles, um, there was an issue with positive pay permission. Um, they weren't seeing it under the extract, so we did <coughs> change that and fixed that. So under extract, those roles should see positive pay. Um, another thing with 717 um, is we updated um, the remap budgets, meaning they aren't, it isn't fully implemented yet, um, but everyone was seeing it on the menu. Um, and when you look at the documentation, it'll note that this isn't fully implemented, we don't have that working uh, properly yet. Um, and so what we did is we updated the permission that's tied to that, and I believe remap budget is underneath system, yeah, right there. Um, and so what we did is we updated it and gave it a higher um, permission so that your um, regular users, standard users and stuff, will not be able to see that. So this basically will be removed from that um, system. Now for us, who have sysmin type of access or admin access, we will still be able to see the remap budget. But there's no point in them seeing it if they can't use it yet. So we did make an upgrade to that um, to change that um, permission on that. Um, those were some of the um, bigger improvements that we made. Um, enhancements I kind of consider like new features and things like that. So I'll talk about those here in a little bit because there are quite a few. But those are the ones I consider improvements. We have been doing performance improvements as well. We did a couple um, performance improvements on 717 regarding reconciling disbursements. And that basically made a change in the performance overall on disbursements and also improving the performance on closing pop-up windows that going faster now instead of it, the blue uh, line blinking. Um, and these performance issues, um, we're constantly working on those. And uh, programmers may be working on something and find that, hey, you know, this could be linked to a performance issue, make corrections, which could speed up the process. So these things are happening all the time, and we are well aware of um, people that have um, discussed um, issues with performance at their um, district. So, they are constantly working on improving the performance of the system. Any questions so far? Okay. Hey, hey Michelle. Um, yeah. I'm really sorry if I missed this, um, not to go back to the first thing here, but the restricting the requisitions, um, so that you can put in like the starting three, is there any 
um, is there a way to do like a possibility of multiple, like with a comma, or it's just strictly, you know, just the ones that start with, you know, these characters? Um, like, could I do it starts with T Z and it start and anything that starts with A B? So you're saying like to T Z comma and then A, B, comma, and it's going to look just at those that start with those requisition numbers, correct? Yeah. Yeah, does it do that, I guess, is my yeah. question? It does. You can have more than one. So as long as awesome. you're separated by commas, you'll be able to do that, correct? Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, bug fixes. Bug fixes. They, we had a lot of bug, bug fixes. Um, but uh, I just wanted to point out a couple here um, because, you know, that would take um, quite a while to get through all of them. And some of them were things that you guys had pointed out to us and we had fixed uh, throughout these past three uh, releases. And some of them were behind the scenes that um, you guys weren't even aware of. Um, and so what we did with the job scheduler, I kind of picked on that one because I wanted to show you um, uh, actually how to create a cron job. And I know I've got that documented, but I thought it wouldn't hurt just to kind of give you a quick run through of how that's done. Um, but the problem, the bug fix that we had is that the view was not displaying the jobs and existing jobs were failing to execute. And we got that fixed back on 716, the first hot fix on that release. Um, but what I wanted to show you is how do those um, cron jobs get created and where can I view them, basically. Um, and so, like I said, we do have um, information and the documentation about it. Um, let me go ahead and show you where that's at. Okay, so I'm going to go to our documentation. And I believe I have it, I have it both, I think, in the report chapter and I have it underneath the appendix. I'm just going to click on reports here and go to the report manager. And I do have an option here, scheduling a report run via cron job. So this is what I'm going to take you through on how to create one. We're just going to create a simple um, cash summary report. Um, but these are the steps you would follow to create that cron job. And so basically this is for um, let's say, you know, a treasurer wants a specific report run at a specific time. So we have one district where our treasurer wants um, a report run every Monday morning and emailed out to um, certain members of his staff. And so we have a cron job set up in order for that to be executed. So it runs, like, I think at 6 o'clock on Monday, every Monday morning. So that person then gets that uh, report. Um, so you can schedule these type of reports here via the cron job. Um, so where um, we'll go ahead and create one first, and then I'll show you where those are stored so you can see when they're going to run. Um, they're underneath the job schedule or in another area. But what we're going to do is we're going to go into, we're going to pick a report here. So I'm going to go back to my instance, <clears throat> and I'm going to go to my home page here. And so we're going to pick on the cash summary report, this one right here. And so when I click on that, um, obviously I could put in all the filters that I want first. So let's say I'm setting up a report for my cafeteria manager, uh, for the cafeteria fund, and I want it to run every Monday morning at 7 a.m. Okay. So what I'm first going to do is add my filter. So if I already have a security filter set up for this person, I can enter it in here, which I do. And let's say I just want active accounts, so I could put in a T for true here. So I've got my filter set up. And obviously, if I want a different format and stuff, um, I just want PDF. And so this guy down here is the job scheduler. So when I click on that, I'm going to get the options to schedule my report. And so with that, I can enter in my job name, um, the cron expression that I'm going to use, and also 
who is going to receive this report. So with the Cron expression, with the job name, um, I do have to be careful that if I'm setting up these job names, let's say I'm setting up cast summary reports for three different people, the cafeteria, the high school band, and the athletic director. So when I set up the job names, they all have to be different. So I can keep it as cast summary reports, and then I can say um, cafeteria or cafe for cafeteria. My next one for the band has to have the word, uh, I'm going to have the word band in it. I can't, all three of them can't just say cast summer report. They all have to be separate names. Now my cron expression here, pull this up here. I'm going to click back on my documentation because I have a link here to show you guys. Um, there is, there's all kinds of free cron expression generators online. And I am going to click on this one here and show you how easy it is to write a chronic expression. And so basically what I'm looking at is just this middle section here. This is where it's going to generate it. And so I'm looking at all of these tabs here. And my seconds, um, it already selects one, but I can obviously change that. Um, the seconds, what it has select, zero seconds is fine. I'm okay with that. Um, my minutes, again, I want it at 7 a.m., so again, zero is okay. Now my hours, obviously, I want to change. I want it to be, and I have to click the check mark behind it, it's seven. Get rid of that. Um, and obviously you'll see that it's military time here, so 7 would stand for 7 a.m. And then my day, and I want this to be generated every Monday. So I'm going to go down to sp um, specific day of the week and check mark Monday. And then the month, I don't really care about because I'm, I'm focused on the week here. And the year, too, I don't really need to do anything in those because they're, they're going to be generated every Monday. So while I was entering and, or selecting things, it was giving me my resulting cron expression down here. And so I could then highlight that and then go back to my instance and paste that in here. And then I'm going to put in who is going to receive this, put in my email. and click on Save. And I get this little quick pop-up that tells me that the cron job has basically been created. And I'm going to exit out of here because I don't plan on generating this. I just wanted to set up my cron job. And I want to show you. Michelle? Yes. Yeah. Can you enter more than one email address separate by commas? I believe you can. I think I might have that documented. Let me look real quick. Mm -hmm. Send output. So you can enter multiple email addresses by separating each of the comma. You are correct. Great. Great. Michelle, one other, I'm sorry, one other question in there. I noticed when you got to the month and the year, there was, every month was checked, but you didn't have to uncheck it. It wasn't part of the cron expression. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Michelle, um, can yes. you send output to a share drive instead of an email? Uh, I don't know if you can. Um, I would have to check on that one. Is this Carrie? Yes, it is. All right, Carrie, let me check on that to see if it can be sent. If so, I'll make note of that. I would think you could, but I, I want to double check on that to make sure. Any other questions? All right, let me show you where this is at. So when I go over to utilities, there is a job scheduler option. And my um, scheduled uh, cash summary report is labeled here. And so it's telling me basically that it's pending and that it's going to be next Monday at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, who created it, the description about the job, and then if I wanted to go in and um, you know, look at the details, I could go ahead and view it. 
if I did it by mistake or, you know, I got the wrong thing, the wrong date, the wrong time, I can just easily delete it here and create a new one. So like I said, we just, like, Milwaukee just started this, um, using it with one of our districts. Um, but um, there is a possibility, you know, of um, you know, doing, you know, further things like this. Um, another thing that I was going to show you um, that's kind of um, somewhat similar to this is um, there's a new link that's going to be added to generate a report where you can um, um, use that link to send that link to somebody like this cash summary report and they could save it um, and then go in and run that report whenever they want. They can almost save like the URL and save that bookmark it and then run that report. I'll get into that at the end, um, but there is something, another way of getting reports to people. Um, also, you can set up um, something similar to FiskWeb. You can set that up as well, but the user would be going in and logging into the system to get that information, and we have documentation on that as well. Um, if that's something you guys would like to do a session on, you know, just shoot me an email, let me know. If we get a lot of interest, we could do a separate session on that too. Okay, any other questions about the cron job? So one thing I did not point out is that in order to use the cron job, there is an email notification service module on any system that needs to be installed beforehand too. So it's just basically installing that email notification service module and um, that has to be turned on before you can start using these. Hey, Michelle. Yes. Yeah. Um, quick question, or because I'm kind of new in this right now, are mm -hmm. these being an ITC, will they all be under one place to look at for each, or do we have to go to the individual um, instances to see these for each district? You would have to, would have to go under each um, district's instance. So like okay. at these job schedules right now, this is just for Cotton Demo School. That's my school yeah. here. So if I had another one, you'd have to go in there and look at theirs. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, what I'm really going to dig into here is um, enhancements that we've made here um, throughout the last three releases. Um, so I'm just going to touch upon the major ones or the ones that, you know, will be of interest to, to you guys. Um, the financial detail has been a real hot topic with everybody, and we did on 715. Um, we released a new version of the financial detail. I'm going to go over to reports. <clears throat> and I'm going to go down to <clears throat> the uh, financial details. So let's scroll up a little bit here. So we've got our financial detail report. This is the one that we've had out there, um, and this allows a user to enter a date range um, to generate the report, but it's not going to include beginning and ending cash balances on it, okay? Now this one that we did on 715, this is the newer version, um, and it's, it's titled Financial Detail Report for the Current Period. And so it's going to allow you to include beginning, it's going to um, look similar, it's gonna run um, the same way uh, that the other one does. I'm gonna go ahead and run this one. But, and I'm just going to pick on one fund here. This report, though, however, is going to give you those beginning and ending balances. So here is my beginning balance, but it's for the period that I'm in. So. It's looking at this is my beginning balance for my current period. I'm in January, <clears throat> so it's giving me January's beginning balance. Any amounts that were received, any amounts that were respect, expended to give me my ending balance down here. Now, we have had requests um, from people 
asking about generating a SIN detail report with the fiscal year beginning balance. So that is something that we are going to create. Um, it's going to be, as of right now, I think it's on the 7.21 release. Um, but we have had people ask how they can go in and tweak this report um, to get to the July 1st and the current ending balance on the report instead of the period one. And I thought I would go ahead and show you guys how to do that in case you are wanting a different flavor. Like I said, we were, SOCT is going to be releasing this, but if your districts are wanting this now, I can show you how to do that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and X out of this one. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to go into the actual report definition for this one for the current period. And I know, too, that you guys probably would like another report session as well, um, going through how to do the filtering, control headers, control footers, things like that. And again, if that's something you guys are interested in, if I get enough interest, I will, will you know, do a session. So just email me and let me know if that's something you guys are interested in. Okay, so I'm in the report def definition now, and um, I'm in the select property option. So right now I'm kind of looking through and I'm looking for that balance, that beginning balance, and you'll notice that it's showing me the beginning period balance. That's not the one I want. I want to replace that basically. So I want to take that and replace that with the initial cash balance is what I want to do. So to look for the initial cash balance, I need to go to the cash account because I'm not going to have initial cash balance right here. So I'm going to click on the cash account, and I should have initial cash here. So I'm going to take this and pull it up and put it here, and I'm going to get rid of the beginning cash balance. I am going to change the sort priority back to what the beginning one was. I want that to be the same. And I can also look at my uh, beginning period um, my extended properties here just to see what else needs to be changed. And so I have to obviously put in the control header so it shows up in that header area, but everything else I think is I don't have to change. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of there and go to the initial cache and set it up the same way. I think everything else looks the same, but I'm just going to do that control header, click on save. I'm going to get rid of the beginning period balance. And my fund balance is still my ending balance for whatever period of time I'm in. So I don't want to change that. That's still the same. Hey, Michelle. Yes. On the, oh, I was kind of mystified about the sort priority on the initial cash. Mm -hmm. It has a one where, you, you know, your your full account code has a one and why would you be sorting by the cash amount? Okay. What's, what's um, the purpose of that? Okay. And, and I know these, and I probably won't explain it as well as Jody would, <laughs> but um, with the sort priorities, obviously I can sort um, these fields using the same number here. So basically what it's basically saying is that, you know, for my full account code, which if I hover over that is my cash account, it's first it's sorting by that, and it's also going to include the description. So I'm going to make that a one as well. So it's all sorting at the same time, basically. And then underneath there, my header and footers are also part of the cash account information. I want that to be sorted first as well, if that makes sense. So my initial cash and my fund balances are also going to be chosen, choosing a sort priority of one. So all four of those are kind of kind of be taking place at once, and then from there, my next sort will be the date. So if that doesn't explain it very well, I might have to get a better explanation from Joey, but I'm kind of saying I want all of this stuff to kind of happen at the same time, so the sort priority is going to be the same. <clears throat> so after the initial cash is added, I'm not going to add anything else. I'm basically replacing my beginning balance with the initial cash. And then underneath configure filters, 
right now, and these are all of the um, fields that I'm filtering on, you'll see my dates are P and D for period. Well, I want it for fiscal. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just, I don't have to do this, but um, I could just, you know, leave that go and still show the beginning balances. But if I'm generating a report for somebody where it's probably maybe an advisor um, and maybe the high school band director wants to see everything from the beginning of the fiscal year for the fund that he's in charge of, I'm going to go ahead and tweak these dates and make them the fiscal period. That way, it's just kind of matching up with my dates um, or my balances because my cash balance is starting at the beginning of the year. So if my cash balance is starting at the beginning of the year, I would want my filters to start at the beginning of the year as well for the date. Okay. I think that's the only thing I have to, oh, I'm sorry, I can, I'm going to leave that a D because it's to the, to the um, current period that I'm in. So from the very beginning of the fiscal year to the end of January, because I'm in January of 2018. And then from here, I'm going to generate the report. And I'm going to narrow this down and just put in the 06. And again, at this point, if I wanted to save this, and say this is my, you know, cafeteria financial report for the fiscal year, I could go in and change the name of this and click on save, and I just saved a new version of this report. I'm going to go ahead and generate it first. And so it's showing me all of my um, information for the cafeteria fund. Here is my beginning balance, my July 1st, 41000 So here's all my activity. So if I go down, so I'm seeing, I shouldn't, sorry, I shouldn't just blow right past that. Um, so this looks pretty similar to what you're seeing on the FinDet uh, Classic, and I've got, and we're not going to have a running balance anymore. That's, um, right now that's not a possibility. Um, but it is showing me what was received and what was expended for those dates. And so it is <clears throat> sorted by date. That was my next sort order. Um, so if I go down, so I got 41547 And if I go down to the bottom and look at my totals here. So 41000 plus um, six. 67,000 is what I receded in all this year, so I'm close to about 110,000, give or take uh, 1,500 or so, minus what I expended so far this year to equal my remaining balance, the 18,000, and that figures about right. So they are able, as long as you know you're training them that you start here, here's your receipts, here's your expenditures, here's your ending balance. I think, you know, they can pretty much follow what's going on with the activity of their fund. Okay, any questions on that? I just wanted to show you how you could customize it to include um, the fiscal year beginning balance plus filtering it um, for the date range starting at the beginning of the fiscal year so it makes more sense to them. Um, and then saving that report. And that is something they can use right now if they want to. But like I said, we are going to have our own version um, in a future release. Okay. I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go back into the report manager here. So I'm just going to click on report manager to get back to my grid. I just want to show you a couple other um, and reports that we've added, um, we have added versions of the fund WebEx. So uh, on release 715, we released um, the revenue and expenditure report by fund or a revenue and expenditure report um, by cash account. So those are down here. So these are the replacements for the fund WebEx. <coughs> um, 
We do have um, a note that the grand totals, um, what it was doing on the report is it was adding expenditures and revenues together on a grand total, and that grand total should really be revenue minus expenditures to show the difference. Um, that's what the classic fund RevEx report was reporting. So we do have a JIRA issue written for that to fix that. So when you're looking at the grand totals right now in those reports, they may not make a whole lot of sense because they're adding them together. Um, but we are going to fix that in order for them to see the difference between revenue minus expenditure. Another report that we created was the appropriated amounts by cash report. I like this report. It's a, a pretty uh, slick one here. I'm going to go back up to the top here. Appropriation amounts by cash. And so I click on that. And I'm just going to generate, um, got no six fund already, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and click on generate. And what I like about this report is it's showing me um, my appropriated amounts for that fund. So I'm be able to see what was you know, my amount that I estimate on spending for the year, my fiscal year to date appropriated. So all of those underlying you know, accounts, appropriation budget accounts, all that stuff is rolled up into here to show me you know, this is what I plan on spending. If I had a prior carryover, this is my expendable, what I have expended so far for that fund, um, and so and then, and then my encumbrances and so on and so forth. So you can see your expendable and your expended all in the same same one here, rolled up into each cash account. Let's see. We also um, had a new SSDT budget transactions report. And I'm probably going to, before I show this to you, I'm going to explain the budget transactions. So this report is going to generate a report of any budget adjustments you made on a revenue or um, a budget account, expenditure account. Um, so it's kind of like, I'm trying to think in classic what report we had that had something similar to that. I keep thinking of in audits, I would be able to see that stuff in there if they made changes um, to the accounts and adjusted figures, I would pull it up in audits. Um, this is a very clean report and it just gives you those actual adjustment figures. So, but before I show this to you, for those of you that aren't really familiar with the budget adjustments, I thought I would go through that with you. So I'm gonna go up to core and accounts and I'm just going to pick on, I'll pick on a revenue account. I'm going to click on the revenue tab. I'm going to pick on my um, cafeteria fund. Just going to enter that in here to narrow it down. And I'm going to go down to this one here, and I want to view it. In order for me to do budget adjustments, I have to view this. If I just go into edit, budget adjustments will not be available in there. So I have to click on view. And so in here then, I just want to take a look at what I'm seeing here. Um, I'm seeing an initial revenue amount of 5000 which um, matches my a receivable figure of five grand, and that is also my GAAP original budget amount. If I wanted to go in and change this and add um, another thousand dollars to this, I would use the budget adjustments up here at the top. I'm going to move this over so you can kind of see what's going on. And this is my test data here. This is what was imported over. So it's giving me um, what was imported during the import, showing that I had $5,000 originally from Classic that imported in here, and my GAAP initial budget was also $5,000. So that's what got imported on that day. So I want to go in and create another one on top of this. And so my period, I'm sorry, my date is a little old here. Um, and 
when I, after I hit my date, you'll notice that it changed from initial to adjustment. I can't add another initial. Um, it's already out there. So it's only going to allow me to do an adjustment. And I want to do a positive adjust, adjustment of $1,000. And I'm just going to click on this so you can see the other option. My other option is doing a gap adjustment as well. <clears throat> and then I can add description here. So this is what's kind of nice is that they have like a little audit trail. It could be something that was approved at the board. So they probably they may want to put the board minutes or something like this or a little more detail as to why they're adjusting this. So I like the, the, the description feature. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to post this. And once I do that, you'll see my new adjustment that was added on. And you'll also see over here in my account that it increased my um, receivable by 1,000. So now it's 6,000. Now, one thing I want to make note of, it did not increase my GAP original budget. So at this point, I will have to go in and create one if that was to be adjusted as well. It just depends on the time of year and when they want to adjust those. I'm going to say GAP. So now I have both my original adjustment and my gap adjustment. So now my receivable and my gap figure should match. So at this point, um, I used a 130 date on these. So I'm going to run a report now um, to show these adjustments that were made. And do you have any questions about the budget adjustments before I leave the screen? All right, so I'm going to X out of here. And I'm going to go back to the reports here, and I can use either go to home or to reports grid. And I want budget transactions is the name of the report. And I'm going to go ahead and put in 30 was my date. And I'm going to go ahead and click on generate. Uh, before I do that, I want to back up here while we're in there. Sorry about that. Um, this is a new uh, field that we've added here, report for a specific posting period, or you can enter a date or a shortcut that can be used. Let's say I did several budget adjustments today, and I want to generate a report of just what I did today. I could go in here and put in a T here, and it's just going to pull up everything that I did today, because T stands for today. So that's one of those shortcuts that can be used. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on Generate here. Click on Save. Pull this up. I didn't get anything. Let me try that again. That wasn't the one that I did. That's another one that I did. I am not quite sure why that didn't take. This should be pulling in both revenue and budget information, or so I thought. So I will have to look into that. But this is a budget adjustment with a 120 date. Um, and so it's showing me here the initial amount that was made on $120,000. So this was an initial budget figure that was done. And then the gap original um, um, date as well. So I went in and did um, a $2,000 adjustment. And then I went in and updated the gap original as well by $2,000. So this is a pretty clean report because it shows me the account 
the description of the account, the date, what type of adjustment it was done, and then the amount. Michelle? Any? Yes. Is there a way to get uh, the, any user information onto this report to see who created that transaction? Well, I'll look at that because it is a, a user um, or it is a template report. So let's take a look here. I'm going to go underneath reports here and see if we can add that. Good question. I'm going underneath budget first, and let me see. I'm not seeing anything that sticks out right now. I'm not sure about that. I will look into that to see if that's a possibility. Does anyone see yeah. anything? There? Yeah, that would be very useful to get that in there. Right. Be underneath here. I thought maybe I don't know if it's it got that recorded because it'd be kind of like a created user adjust you know budget adjustment type of thing that we would need to have. So I don't see anything, but that doesn't mean that we can't. So I will look into that. Let me write that down here. And Michelle, so you're thinking based on what you ran today that this report is just looking at changes to budget accounts, not revenue accounts? I can't say that for sure um, it, unless I go in and actually do a budget one right now. I figured that it would do both. Uh, let me see while we're in here. Full account code. Well, look at that. It's just showing budget. <laughs> so that's why. I think. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to throw that. That's yep. what I thought you were thinking. Yep. So, it, but we, you guys would like to see both, right? I mean, if they go make any changes to anything, we want to see be able to see both budget and revenue. So, so let me make note of that. That's probably why. And that would be a quick. That's a quick report that we could really create ourselves. Um, by just going in and using this one as a template and just um, <clears throat> kind of making some changes um, and actually doing, I wonder if we could go down and do, well, yeah, because it doesn't have anything about revenue. So I would have to ask about that. Well, the object is budget transaction, right? Up right at the top, budget transaction. Right. So, should it, so will it have revenue on it if, if the object is budget transaction? No, and I don't know if we have a. Revenue you know what I mean? Like you're starting from budget transactions, so right. you may never see revenue. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, yeah, but they, I wasn't, they, may, they may have to write another report. Do you think? Which wouldn't be that bad because you could run a different one for revenue accounts and then your budget account. Right. I'm surprised we don't have something out there already, but I didn't know if like the budget transactions meant it, it would be able, we would be able to see like it's just budgeted figures, whether it's budgets or revenues, that both of those would be in here. I wasn't quite sure um, if it would have both in here we could select from, like, because we have a budget, but I thought maybe it'd also have a revenue one in here, but apparently it doesn't. And when I go look down to the other property or other objects, I'm not seeing a revenue one, so I have to ask about that. Kind of glad I did it that way because I'm sure we have people probably asking about it. So, <clears throat> all right. Any other questions? 
So right now the budget transactions report can only do budgets and I'll find out about a revenue one. All right, um, the next thing I'd like to talk about um, on 716, we did a EIS catch-up report um, to pull in inventory items. And so if you you know, have districts um, that are <coughs> using EIS Classic, um, Jody had sent out a message back on, I think in February, back on the 22nd, um, and she sent a message to SSDT notices about the catch-up report. Now this EIS catch-up report is not something we just have out here on the system. It's a one-time thing, so we did not put it as an available report in the report grid. When she sent that message to you guys, she included the JSON file in that message for you guys to input that report into um, whatever district needs to run this. And so basically what happened was is we did a correction on December 5th, I believe, on um, the 712 release um, to set the inventory flag on the AP invoice. It wasn't being set before that. So when they're going in and let's say their EIS threshold information was set up in the redesign to say all 600 object codes with a pending amount of $500. Um, it wasn't setting those before this fix, the 712 fix, before December 5th. Um, and so for those that came on live onto the redesign before that, we created this catch-up report to find all of those items in order for them to get imported into EIS because those items were not flagged. If they installed the 712 release, you know, on December 5th, that's something you guys have automatically handled that it installs those updates. Then from that point on, when they invoice, it would set the flag on those items. So this catch-up report was created, and I'm gonna click on it here so you can see what it looks like. And Jody included um, a nice little um, Word document as well with step-by-step -step on how to run that catch-up report. <clears throat> and so when I pull this open here, um, the options here it's asking me for, what is your beginning and ending object codes on this? Well, obviously, I would want, if I'm choosing just 600s, I would have 600 to 699 here. And then also my invoice date. So when did they start um, live on the redesign? So you would put in that start date of whatever that was up through December 4th to when that release was installed. And then you can have a threshold amount as well. So if their threshold amount is set up to be $500, you could put the 500 in here. It's gonna generate a report of all those items that were never flagged um, in EI in redesign. And it's gonna pull those into a report then that then can get transferred over into um, Classic and imported in through this EIS import program that we created, this uh, Classic program. And so that email that Jody um, had sent out has step-by-step -step on what everything, everything that you need to do in order to do this catch-up report. And then from the fifth on, we do have a regular inventory extract report. So it's called inventory pending extract that you can run to get everything from when that fix was um, out till now if they wanted to. So basically they're gonna have two reports, the catch-up report and then this report that's gonna extract anything that's been flagged with that 600 object code and whatever pending threshold amount. And then those reports then, like I said, get file transferred over to Classic and we have an EIS import program. And I'm gonna take you while that's pulling up here. I'm going to take you to where that's at. I do have in the appendix just a little 
procedure <clears throat> to creating that inventory extract. So it's just steps on, it's not the catch-up report, it's just the regular inventory extract. So it just gives you, gives you step by step and how to go in and pull up that report, enter in your information, and then it, how, and then you have to basically file transfer it over into Classic, and then this new EIS IMPR option <coughs> in Classic <coughs> can be run. And you would put in those pending files that you named <clears throat> in the redesign. So you're going to have to do them one at a time. Um, so I do my first one here. And then what that does, it doesn't add tags. It just adds it to the pending file. So at that point then, after you import these in, you can go to the pending <clears throat> option underneath EIS screen, or you can run a 501 report and look at all those items that it added to the pending file. <clears throat> and then from there, you would proceed normally with entering your, your items in item screen. Any questions on that? Does this process bring over the acquisition uh, information to create in EIS, as if you had a, uh, an item created in a pending file from Classic? Yes, yeah, so your purchase order. Um, the purchase order gets in there. Um, I don't believe, I think I had a note here about the check, and maybe that's just on the catch-up report. It will not have the check number on there, but when you're doing a regular inventory extract, it'll have the PO information, the check address, the check information, vendor, all of that stuff that you normally saw on the acquisition record. Wonderful. Thank you. So, so when you go in then and look at that, in the 501 report, you know, take a good look because it should have the same stuff that you normally would if you would have done um, the invoice in Classic. It should have those same fields. So when you actually go in and add that item then through item screen, it should pull all that in and create the acquisition record as well as the item record. All right. Any other questions? Uh, another thing I just want to quick show you guys that was on 717, but there's not a whole lot to it right now, is um, we do have, um, we are starting the ability to implement the monthly CD and fiscal CD archives from Classic. So it's not the actual monthly CD option and redesign. It's taking your archive data from Classic and importing it into the redesign so that everything is in the same spot. So they don't have to go back to, you know, uh, classic or to, you know, their, the monthly CD archive reports on the web, pull that stuff up. They can get this stuff in here now. So we're getting to that point of getting that stuff set up. So I just want to show you where that's at. Um, but I believe the next version, we're going to add more to it so you're going to be able to see more. But for right now, when I go down to utilities, there is a file import and there's a file archive. Now the file import is going to actually <clears throat> upload the zip file that's coming from Classic. So if you've got their fiscal year information zipped or for the, for the entire year um, in a zip file, you can go in here <clears throat> and import that zip file. So this is basically just going in and allowing you to import that in there. So like I said, typically it, could, it would contain a whole directory structure, so it's going to have all years for a given district. So if I've got, you know, 10 years worth of monthly CD data, it's going to pull all 10 years in. I'm going to zip it for all 10. And then what's going to happen then is once it imports in, they are going to eventually see it in this file archive option. So right now, you're not seeing anything. Um, but I think on the next, I believe on the next release, if not the release after that, it's going to show that information, the fiscal year, and it's going to have a listing of all of the reports, like for each month, with a downloadable link that you can click on that specific report and download it if you need to. So it's basically the replacement for all what's already sitting out there in monthly CD for this district. It's going to get all 
import it in, and they will be able to look up all of those archived reports in the redesign. So I'm looking forward to seeing that and seeing how that all works. So we should, we've had a little bit of a preview of it, but I really haven't gotten a really good look at it yet, but that's what the intention is of this, to be able to download those archived reports from Classic. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to move on then. I do still have quite a bit to cover here, not too much more, but... Um, Michelle. Yeah. Just a quick question, I'm sorry. I, might, I had a problem with my phone there. Um, as far as these monthly CDs, uh, we have obviously will have to um, export and import them into the redesign for uh, prior to when our districts went live. But from this point forward, when you run things, will it archive from here on for us in the redesign reports, or only what you did in Classic? We don't have that capability yet um, okay. of what on the readers right now and archiving that, that's not available yet. This is just going to be for that archive data that's coming from Classic. Good question. Uh -oh. yep. Okay. I just, I'm, I'm more looking for payroll for mine, you know, but it, it's kind of the same thing. So I just wanted to know if that was something that might become available. And I, and I know that, um, you know, payroll, they're, you know, trying to do the same thing with payroll CD. I don't know how far they've come over on the payroll side with that to see mm -hmm. if and they already have this in place, but I'm not sure if they've gotten that far yet with archiving redesign reports yet. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Lori will be talking about that stuff um, in a few weeks when she goes through the payroll highlights. So um, she'll kind of give you guys a status update on that. Um, one other feature that we added, I believe, in 715, I'm going to go back to the reports here. And I'm just going to pick on a cash summary here. I'm just going to pick on a budget summary since it's right here. Um, we did add a filter um, to a filter name field to several uh, reports um, in the redesign. And so from here, um, they could go in and enter in, and this is coming from the account filters area, enter in a filter name here, and it will filter then. Um, whatever is from that account filter. So if I had a pretty elaborate account filter set up with specific object codes and stuff like that, um, this might be the easiest way to get that type of report in here is creating that account filter first and then going underneath the filter name, entering that filter name and generating that report. Now I know a lot of people say, well, I want to be able to go in and do a range of objects and stuff like that. I want to do it on the screen. We just don't have that capability um, at this point. So you, if you have some type of elaborate where you have a lot of different accounts you want on that report, you're going to have to create a filter ahead of time. But what's nice is once you do put that in here, you can save that report parameter, almost like the save sets that we had in Classic. So if I had a pretty elaborate one, I'm just going to put test in here. I don't know if I've got that account filter. I'm going to get rid of this. And what I can do then is um, I put that filter name in here. I go up to the save recall, kind of led me into this. I wanted to show you guys this. And what I can do is I can choose an empty one and put in, this is, you know, for my cafeteria manager or for, you know, cafeteria reports or some type of, I don't know, elaborate report that I'm using specific object codes, maybe for object codes 200, 100, something like the salaries and benefits. And basically from there then what, what I can do Try that again. And then what I can do then is click on this guy. He will then, he was grayed out, but once I enter in a name, 
whatever name here that whatever useful name I have. Sorry, it took out my 100 to 200. I'll save that, and then I can go in and recall that at any time. So what happens is if I go in, you know, tomorrow, and I want to pull this up, I would basically click on this down arrow, and that specific um, save set is going to be on here. So I could have a very long trail of save sets that I have saved for my budget summary report. But I know that we've had a couple of questions from people saying, you know, they've got their fil filters, but they can't remember, you know, you know, what the filters were. Well, add the filters in here, enter in the filter name here, and then give it a name up here and save that save set. So obviously this is not going to show up on the report grid. The report grid is still going to show the budget summary report, but underneath my budget summary report, I've got all these different save sets. And as long as those names make sense to me, I can pull that up and run that report. So you can either do a save set. If I don't like my save set anymore, I can click on the X to delete it. And I'm going to talk about this link here a little bit later. I'm going to add that to my 718 highlights, but it is out there now, but we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, the other options you're going to see in here, obviously default, default back to the default settings, and most recent, and that I believe is the default option. So if I went in here and created a budget summary report of just my 006 funds, generated the report, came back in here later today, and open up the budget summary, it's going to say my most recent. I'm going to see my 006 um, options from my prior run. So those are basically you know, blank to create one, the default, and most recent. So you know, I'm kind of pushing districts to take advantage of these save and recall options. Um, if they were big safe set users, um, you know, some of those that they know that they still want in here, they can still do that. Any questions? Is that only on the, Michelle, is that only on the BUDSUM, or are you entering, going to create that on other reports too? Yeah, they're on almost, on, on quite a few, actually. So we've got several okay, of them. But, all of our reports have that option. But the one thing I want to uh, make note of is it's available at the home page. If I go in to the actual report definition through the report, um, so let me, let me explain that. So I'm going to go back. Or it's available at the home page and at the report manager underneath the generate option. If I would go in and actually open up the report definition for some reason, which most people aren't going to do that, um, it is not going to show underneath the generate tab so when I click on this generate report tab, you're not going to see that here. It's just using that generate option icon, either at the grid or at the home. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that pretty much covers everything that was major things on the last three releases. Um, I would like to show you a couple of um, things, up and coming things that are coming up on uh, the future releases. So I'm going to switch over to another instance that has that information. And this one I think you guys are going to, or your users are going to really like, is I'm going to go into transactions and I'm going to go into receipts. And so we've had um, a lot of questions about <clears throat> when adding an item on either a purchase order or a receipt. I'm going to go down to the items here. And using the hyphens in the account window. So that is still an available option. So they can filter. But what we've added over here is this little uh, view option. And it's very similar to what they were used to seeing in UTAS Web. And so what this is going to allow them to do is if I click on that right away, it's going to bring up a search window. And it's going to allow me to put in a specific, you know, whatever filters I want. And it's going to, the minute I press tab <clears throat> and tab to the next field, it starts already filtering. 
So I can be, you know, I can put as much filtering as I want up here. But you'll notice it gives me the account, the description, the received amount, and um, the percent received. And so from here then I can click and load that account in. Same thing with purchase orders. I've got that same option in there too. So a lot of people wanted to see those balances or see those figures or be able to see the description better or there were some people that just did not like the actual going in and putting in hyphens in, in between. They could bypass that and go right to the search feature. So that is something that I believe is going to be on the next release. So I wanted to show you guys that, that for those that are missing that option from UCAS Web, it's there now. Any questions about that? That's awesome. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Um, Michelle, on, on that search, when you go into that magnifying glass, you could put in like um, 006 and then a 5 in the object field and get a search that way? Yeah, let me try this here. I think I've had some. Yeah, I don't see how it's something. Yeah, you can put in a partial of something else or sure? not sequential um, areas, let, let me see. If I put in like percent, I'm just going to try this here. Yeah, so I can use wild cards here too. Okay. So percent to use filter. Mm -hmm. So if they just wanted the fund and the OPU, you could put that in there and it should narrow it down. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Welcome. Um, another thing that uh, is going to be on, um, I believe, on the next release is creating an optional rule that's going to warn users if their invoice amount exceeds their remaining encumbrance. So it's not a rule by default, <clears throat> but so it will have to be enabled in order for people to use it. Um, but once that's enabled, when they go in to do an invoice, if that amount they're processing that invoice if it exceeds the remaining encumbrance, they're going to get a warning about that. Um, and I know that they're getting close to um, also making AP invoice in a grid format and not in the old um, stress UI. So that is something that I know they've been working on. So hopefully that will be released here within the next few releases. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and forgive me because this is still kind of new to me, but I thought, you know, new to me, new to you, we'll all kind of look at it together, is downloading a report directly using a hyperlink. And so if I back up, back into reports here, <clears throat> so I'm going to go back just to the grid. And I'm going to go back to um, like a budget or cash summary here. And I'm talking about this guy here. So um, what this is going to do is this little link here is going to enable, is enabled whenever you're trying to pull up any saved report parameters. So you'll notice it's grayed out when I do most recent. But if I've got like student activities, for example, here, it will enable this report link. And what this will do is it's going to correct, create a direct hyperlink to execute this report, and I can take this hyperlink and I can bookmark it in a URL. I can send it via like an email message. I can place it on a web page, and I could also use it in a web query in Excel, kind of a replacement for Safari for a report. Um, and basically, all somebody would have to do is go in and refresh that URL to get that cash summary report that they want. So in my example, um, my student activities, I would say, you know, I've got 300 funds here for that. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on this so I can show you what it looks like. And so obviously my format's PDF. So in this case, it's going to be a PDF format. So when I click on this, it's going to show the report link, and it says use your browser to copy this web address to execute the report directly or to create a bookmark. So do I want to include the parameters on this? I sure do, because I want to show you that too. Um, and so basically then I can copy this, and then I'm just going to go ahead and open up. A new 
window. And I'm just going to hit enter. And it's going to, my browser set up to download it when I click on it. Now I could take this now and bookmark this, this URL, save this. And ta-da, first I want to show you this. Um, it generated the report. This is our new report parameters page that we're adding to all the reports. So this is another thing I believe is going to be on the next release. So I hope you guys like it. It's basically showing, this is a cache summary, so it's showing me who ran it, when, and at what time. Um, what report parameters did I select? I selected the PDF and everything else is basically the default. What is the name of the report? This is my cache summary report. And what parameters did I include? And it does have here the 300. Not right, quite sure why it doesn't show it down here. Um, this, could, this is still a work in progress, so I thought they were supposed to be down here. But I really do like how that looks. Um, one other thing they're going to add to that too is they're going to show you on this cache summary the current um, period that you're in. So the current posting period is January. And also, if I had a date range, which the cash summary I don't, but if I was doing like a financial report, it would show the actual date range that I selected on the second page as well, and all other pages. So every page after this will have the posting period, and if there was a date range in the parameters, it would show the date range as well. So. I need to have a little more information about all the possibilities with this new link feature. And I'm either going to record a video or we'll go over this um, later in another Friday webinar once I get more information. But you can see how I could take this report and bookmark it. And I could go to that bookmark then and refresh it. And it remembers the 300 fund and it will, and it will create that cash summary report for me. Any questions about that? I think that's awesome. Great. That's great. That is great. It's kind of mind boggling because I'm like trying to think of all the different things you could do with that. So I'd like to get a handle on all those different things you could do with that and share it with you guys, but I think that'll be pretty cool. All right, just a couple other things. That's all I wanted to show you actually on the instance, but I just had a couple other announcements that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, for one, just a reminder, I'm going to go to the wiki here, and we do have that uh, shared reports and training links out there for those of you that would like to share information, presentations, training documents, um, actual like checklists that you've done for your districts that you'd like to share with the other ITCs. Um, if I go down to the state software redesign here in the redesign production implementation, that's got a lot of good stuff in there. And in there, the redesign support resources are for you guys, for the ITC fiscal staff. And that shared training and implementation documents are in here. So I believe we've had the majority of the ITC staff set up um, in order to upload documents in here. I'm just going to click on the training one here. And so these are the training documents that are out here right now. So if you guys want to, and I'm not logged in, but if I was logged in, I would see a browse window down here allowing me to upload documents. So you can upload stuff in here and share it, and the only people that are going to see it are people that have access to this link, and that's ITC fiscal staff. So we've got the training, and we also have the implementation checklist. If you've got a checklist um, that you'd like to share, you can upload in there. That way you can get ideas from what other ITCs are doing when they're actually implementing their districts. So again, feel free to put whatever you need, you know, that you feel would be helpful for the other ITCs in here. So that's one thing I wanted to remind you guys about. Um, another announcement, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to announce this yet, but I'm going to anyways. Um, we are removing the legacy uh, requisitions. Um, I think we're planning on doing the legacy requisition option in underneath transactions um, in June, I believe. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up for those of you that have possibly trained um, 
districts on the legacy option or you were thinking about it, um, you might want to change your plans and, uh, and make sure that they're trained on the actual um, grid-based format of the requisitions. So we are going to be removing that. Hi, Michelle. This is Carrie, and I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion about that, but I just want to throw out an idea in case it has not been considered. Has okay. it been considered to just give that screen a certain permission so that it's optional for a certain period of time so um, that people could remove it who didn't want it and then people could keep it if they wanted it? We um, did ask about that. Um, and. We, we did ask, I believe it was asked at the um, prioritization meeting, and I believe um, everyone agreed that um, it would just be removed, but uh, I could bring that up again to see um, if it's a possibility, but I think everyone pretty much vetoed that, that we just have a clean break and just get rid of it um, altogether. Um, hey, Michelle. Do, yeah. do you know what, what version they're removing it? Is it... Is it proposed for a certain release yet? I don't know if Jody has actually created the issue for that yet. Um, but once I find that out, I, will, I can share that with you guys um, because I know they're slating to, to have it in June sometime. Um, um, I think probably for the next wave. Um, so I will, uh, I'll find out about that. And once that gets created, they'll have a version number attached to that issue. Good question. Michelle? Hey, Carrie. Oops, sorry. Michelle? Yeah. Just a quick question or a comment, I guess. Um, we've trained full districts. The teachers use that grid uh, or that legacy version to create requisitions. Mm -hmm. And that would mean we'd have to train whole buildings again on how to do it the new way. So just in your conversations, would you mention that? I will. I will definitely. Thanks. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Hey, Michelle, if, if I could address those. Um, when we discussed um, this the other day, one, the, the piece that was holding back to keep the legacy on there was that search bar that, that Michelle showed us earlier that you could search those accounts easier. Um, yeah. So that capability is going to be available to Carrie and, and whomever just spoke. And, and they talked about um, they being SSDT and the advisory meeting um, or committee creating tools to be helpful in that training, um, you know, getting them moved over from that legacy to the requisition. And really to compare them side by side is the pictures that look different and nothing else. So hopefully that transition will be easy, but that was definitely talked about and definitely a consideration uh, that was taken. Definitely. I'm glad you brought that up, Heidi, about the, um, the having that new search feature, because that, that was reason why some people wanted to go with the legacy option, because they didn't have that. But now that we will have that in the redesign, you know, that's going to be very helpful um, for people to be able to see their balances and be able to see those description and confirm that they have the right accounts and things. So, um, but yeah, we did, you know, we just, we discussed it in length the other day. Um, so, but I, I will, I will um, uh, take this back as well. One other thing I wanted to show you guys before we leave, and I promise this is the last thing, is underneath, um, Go back to the manual here. Okay. Um, underneath reports, um, we've got you know our actual report manager that has all of our template reports and things like that. Um, but another thing that I have added, and I don't have it in here, um, but underneath. I wasn't quite sure where to put it. I can put it instead underneath the custom report creator. What I've done, and it's still a work in progress, is underneath generate new custom report, it has the steps on how to generate. Those have been out there. But under the configure filters part, I'm just going to scroll down so you can kind of see. Just, you know, and just keep in mind that this create a custom report does have all the information about 
um, the customized properties, the extended properties, what those all mean. Um, but what I've added here is a configure filter se section. I've enhanced this. And for one, I've created, or I'm not, I didn't create this, Jody did. Uh, I don't want to take credit for her excellent work. Um, but uh, she created an actual place where she used examples on how to create a filter value parameter under the configure filters. So here's your configure filters tab when you're creating a report or um, customizing a template report and the different options here. And she's got examples in this link to show you how to do that. What I've then done is I went in and explained, you know, how to filter, and I have given examples and all the different operations, what the definition means, and examples of how to hard code a filter in there or to create a parameter. These are just examples. So like, for example, this first one, if you use the equals operation, it's going to match any exact value. So for example, an account filter. So I could say the filter equals the high school band, and that's kind of considered a hard-coded filter. Um, when I hard-code something in and I go to, to the generate report, this um, uh, field is not going to show because I hard-coded it in. So that filter is not going to display because it doesn't need to. I told it I just want high school band. So that's not going to appear when I generate the report. Now, if I want to set it up to prompt me to enter in a specific filter, I would use this option, filter equals, and I create a parameter, filter name. And when you generate the report, slide this over here, this is what it's going to look like under query parameters. So by entering this filter value here, you're establishing a filter name in, or, or a filter prompt and basically you enter in the filter name here at the generate option. Hard coding won't give you that option, but if you want a quick report on just searching for a certain thing, you can do it this way. If you want to set up a parameter, because you're setting this up for one of your districts, and they want you know, something to be included in there, you can set up a parameter, and that's what it's going to look like. So what I've done is I've gone through, I'm not done yet, but I've gone through a lot of these, you know, what if I use the one of operation? How can I set up a parameter there and I just show one example and then how it looks like when you generate the report. So these are out here to kind of guide, give you guys a little bit of a guideline um, as to what these parameters mean um, or what these operations mean, excuse me, what their definition is and example of how you can set one up. So and like I said, Jody's link, when I click on that here, goes into it a little bit further and just gives you an example of one that she's done. So she just goes through all these different options. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, I appreciate you guys. I'm so sorry that um, I was uh, delayed here this morning, but I appreciate you guys hanging on the line with me. I thought this one was going to take over an hour but I really wanted to um, get as much information as I can so you guys feel a little more comfortable with the new uh, features that have been brought on these last few releases. If you guys don't have any other questions, have a wonderful weekend. And hey, we Michelle. Will be doing yes. It's Brian over at Access. Could you yes. show me real quick how I could get to the documentation on how to do the export out of ARF for Classic and then import the receipts into the redesign? Is that uh, out there anywhere? For, are you talking about um, the like pending transactions, Brian? With I'm not sure. Dave had mentioned it to me because we have some districts that use ARF, and he said there was an easy export to pull it out and put it the receipts into the redesign so that they could still use it but yet move to the redesign. Okay, we do have underneath transactions, um, underneath pending transactions. Take you there. And those have to be in a certain format, and the actual like spreadsheet that you're going to, um, yeah. Oh, well, however, what form? What format are you using? You're using the R format, like the actual. I'm not sure how it's going to come out of Classic. 
Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> no. Okay. I I have to I have to look into that to see. Okay. I don't know about at that part. He's probably ahead of me when it comes to that stuff. Okay. So do you want me to enter a ticket for that? Yes. Why don't you go okay, ahead? Okay, I will do that. that. But what happens, Brian, is once that format set up and stuff, you can use the import option in here, I believe, and choose that file, and you can import those in and you know upload those transactions in. So okay, perfect. Um, but yeah, yeah, send, create a ticket, and we'll look into that further. I'll do that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Right, like I said, we will be doing budgeting the first week of April. And then Lori is going to be doing uh, a review of the payroll highlights the following week on the 12th. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs>